Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for the final session on our X-ray binaries extravaganza that has lasted all day. Um, and also the final session for this week of the Chandra Frontiers in Time Domain Science virtual workshop. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And I want to point out next week's schedule. Uh, which starts on Monday at 9.30 a.m. for Neutron Stars and Magnet Magnetars uh, session, uh, followed by another one at 11.30. And then on Tuesday, we have two sessions on active galactic nuclei starting at 9 a.m. and one at 2 p.m. And then on Friday is the last day of our month-long workshop, and it's on multi-messenger astronomy featuring talks and a panel and then we have a closing event uh, given by John Miller and folks from the Chandra Director's Office. I'd like to thank all of the speakers that we have today on this uh, session of, for X-ray binaries. And now I'd like to ask Alexandra Tararenko to share their slides. Um, our first speaker today is Alexandra, Alexandria, I'm sorry, Alexandra Tetra. Tetra Renko from East Asian Observatory, who will speak to us about multi-wavelength fast timing in X-ray binaries. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning slash afternoon, everyone, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working to develop for several years now, um, using time domain observations to study jet physics in X-ray binary systems. And this work is done in collaboration with some of my favorite people listed on the slide right here. So before I get into all the cool science that we can do with the time domain, I wanna kind of firstly just briefly backtrack a bit and try and motivate why it's not only important to understand jet phenomenon in general, but why X-ray binaries are the best way to do it. So determining how jets arise and quantifying the energy they carry are really important multifaceted problems in astronomy with implications for other fields of physics as well. For instance, jets have a fundamental effect on their environment where injected energy can alter the chemistry of interstellar gas, in turn influencing large scale processes, such as the formation of stars and even the evolution of entire galaxies. Uh, further black holes and their outflows also provide unique laboratories to probe fundamental physics beyond Earth-based experiments. So for example, in creating the first image of a black hole, the Brent Horizon Telescope has performed the most stringent tests to date on Einstein's theory of general relativity. Additionally, jets also come into play within new exciting areas of multi-messenger astrophysics. For instance, one of the most promising uh, astrophysical candidates for high energy neutrinos is actually the jets launched from supermassive black holes, because these jets can accelerate some of the most energetic particles in our universe, which when they interact with radiation and matter in this, in this environment can create these kind of exotic particles like neutrinos. So these jets are everywhere across our universe, but Despite their importance, we still understand very little about their origin and especially their fundamental properties. So our best chance to actually change this doesn't mean we have to necessarily be studying the big supermassive black holes like all the examples I just showed you on the previous slide, because it turns out that the smaller stellar mass black holes existing in X-ray binaries in our galaxy are actually ideal test beds for jet phenomenon. You know, they're, they're numerous, they're close to Earth, and they evolve on human time scales. So the majority of these systems are transient in nature, where they're going to progress from periods of minimal activity into a bright outbursting state on time scales of days to months, which means we can basically watch them change in real time. Uh, as you can see from the figure on the slide here, these objects are truly broadband objects emitting across the electromagnetic spectrum. And it kind of gives you a hint of why uh, multi-wavelength studies of these systems are going to be so important. Of particular importance for today's talk, though, is the jet-emitting wave bands. So we're talking the longer wavelength radio submillimeter infrared bands. So if you dig into the X-ray binary literature, more often than not, what you're going to find is 
photometric studies or even direct imaging studies with very long baseline inter interferometry of these jets. But it turns out that time domain observations, essentially measuring how the intensity of the light we receive from these jets changes on different time scales, can offer us a promising new way to actually address some of the key open questions in jet research. For example, we can probe physical size scales that aren't accessible with current imaging capabilities beyond even what the Event Horizon Telescope could do if we pointed it at an X-ray binary. And in this way, we can actually zoom in close to the black hole where these jets are first launched and accelerated. Um, the time domain also allows us to probe some notoriously difficult to measure quantities, such as the energy output of these jets and the speed. Also through comparing uh, variability signals across different wave bands, we can actually be able to link changes in the inflowing material with changes in the jet, thereby mapping out a sequence of events leading to jet launching and particle acceleration like never before. So there's a lot we can learn from detecting variability in these systems. But to really take advantage of that, we need the right tools that allow us to not only characterize the variability that we see, but also connect variability, variability signals between different wave bands. Um, and some of the tools that we have at our disposal to do this is uh, first, uh, simple cross-correlation analysis. This allows us to compare two signals, determine how correlated they are, and even place estimates between any kind of time lag or delay we might see between the emission in different bands. And this is really useful, especially for jet studies, because within these jets, uh, higher electromagnetic frequencies are going to probe closer to the black hole, and the lower electromagnetic frequencies are going to probe farther out in the jet flow. So by actually measuring these delays, this allows us to actually get at the jet speed parameter, which are, I'll show you a bit more later on in the talk. Um, but moving beyond the cross correlation kind of analysis, we can go, we can actually go into the Fourier domain. And these analyses are a lot more powerful because they add another dimension to this, to just a simple cross correlation, because we can actually be able to measure lags and correlation behavior and variability amplitudes split up over many different time scales of variability. And this really gives us um, much more information about what's going on. Um, but to, actually be able to implement all these um, wonderful techniques, we need some solid software to do so. And I want to highlight one package in particular that I found to be quite brilliant. Um, this is a Python package called Stingray, and it can do all this kind of uh, time domain analysis. It's super easy to use, and I really do suggest anyone who kind of does this stuff to check it out if you haven't. All right. so. Given their incredible kind of diagnostic potential, time domain studies, they've been used extensively to study accretion around uh, cell mass black holes at X-ray wavelengths. But it's only recently that technological advancements have actually made it possible to do these kind of time domain studies in the jet dominated longer wavelength part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the first exci exciting advances um, in studying jet variability in X-ray binaries actually came uh, in the optical and infrared frequencies. And this was mainly due to the invent in the early 2000s of these new fast readout detectors that essentially allowed us to start probing sub-second time scales at these wave bands, getting closer and closer to what could be done in the X-ray. And the, the first unambiguous detection of fast variability from an X-ray binary jet actually came from GX339-4. Um, and not only was significant variability found in the jet emission down to sub-second time scales. But you know, the infrared and optical was found to be highly correlated with the X-ray emission. And that's actually what you see on the left side of the slide here. It's a cross-correlation function between the X-ray and infrared emission in this system, um, showing a clear delay at about 100 milliseconds. Um, so this was really kind of the first suggestion that variations in the accretion flow probed by the x-ray could actually be driving variability in the jet probed by the infrared in this case. It was really, uh, it was really important kind of proof of concept for this science. And it's not just this one system now, GX39, but this same kind of correlated um, emission has been seen in other sources like B4-4-SIG and uh, MAXCJ1820, which I'm also going to talk about a bit later in the talk. Um, and 
more recently, there's actually been some other, some really exciting studies uh, that have shown that we can actually reproduce some of these, all these, these four-year timing metrics that I've been talking about with real jet models. We can, we can model power spectra, the legs, um, how correlated the signals are. And this, this is really exciting because it opens up the possibility of actually being able to study physical processes happening in the jet through just the analysis of variability, variability signals alone. Now, uh, being a radio astronomer myself, you know, when I saw these um, optical infrared timing studies, it made me wonder, well, what if we could do this at even longer wavelengths? What if we could do this in the radio and the submillimeter? We could get a complete picture all the way from the X-ray down to the radio of what's happening in these X-ray binary systems. Well, we've known for a while that radio jet emission is highly variable in these systems. But while the longer time scale variations have been you know, tracked and well characterized in a lot of systems, this really wasn't the case for the short time scale variations. So we're talking less than a day, less than an hour, for which there was only maybe like a handful of detections. And up until recently, there had been really little effort to actually analyze this kind of short time scale variability. For example, um, the plot on the slide you see there was up until a few years ago, really the only radio frequency for your domain study of X-ray binaries that had ever been done in the shortest time scales that they were probing were days. Now, the main reason for this kind of lack of study, I suppose, in this area was that, you know, time resolved observations are such a staple for X-ray binaries at the higher frequencies, the X-ray and even the optical and infrared these days. But we face a lot more challenges when we try and do this in the radio in the cell millimeter. Um, in particular, it can be difficult to, for example, disentangle intrinsic source variations from atmospheric or telescope gain variations. Um, observations often involve routinely cycling between observing a target source and a calibrator. And in most cases, you can only observe one wave band at once. And these kind of obstacles are preventing continuous observations of the jet. They can introduce artificial periodic signals in the data, um, both of which are gonna complicate an attempt at doing any kind of time domain analysis. Further, up until recently, a lot of the telescopes in these wave bands weren't even sensitive about, enough or capable of taking this rapid second to sub-second data. And we couldn't even go and look back into archival data of X-ray binaries either, because for example, if you take a look at you know, the VLA archive in the radio, what you're gonna find is just usually short scans single frequency band separated by days. And that really limits our ability to try and connect any variability that we might see with internal jet physics. You know, in the radio, it's not like we have something like RXTE with this brilliant archive that we can go and mine. So I've kind of painted a bit of a bleak picture, but it turns out that with today's more sensitive interferometric arrays, which offer a lot of more customizable and flexible observing modes, we can actually begin to start lifting some of these limitations that I've talked about and accurately sample extra binary jets at the radio and cell millimeter frequencies in the time domain. But unlike the optical and infrared where it was really the catalyst for doing these kind of studies was a better instrument, just having a better instrument isn't enough at these longer wavelengths. Because of these extra challenges that we face, we have to get super creative with how we're using our um, much more sensitive instrument. In particular, uh, one technique that's proven to be incredibly important in overcoming some of these time domain limitations in the radio has been what we call subarrays. So when we have a big interferometric array like the VLA, what we can do is we can separate the array into individual subarrays, basically operating independently of each other. So you can imagine, for example, observing one frequency band with each subarray, and then you solve this simultaneous multiband problem. And we did this um, initially quite successfully during the 2015 outburst of V4 or SIG, where we were able to sync up this subarray VLA with a couple of submillimeter telescopes here in Hawaii, and we were able to sample this incredibly beautiful flaring activity in these light curves. Um, and a bit of a kind of a fun fact about using these kind of subarrays with the VLA is that 
if you actually dig deep enough into the literature, you'll find that uh, Felix Mirabel attempted to do this with the old VLA back in the late 90s. So he actually gets the credit for coming up with this technique. Um, so this was, this was great, you know, getting all the simultaneous multiband data, but we were a bit more ambitious because we thought, well, what if we could sync up our individual subarrays so that we could get longer bouts of continuous data at multiple bands? And this means that this would give us access to Fourier domain techniques, which you saw were incredibly important, especially in the optical and infrared studies. So our first attempt at uh, doing this was we synced up a subarray VLA with new star in the X-ray to look at Cygnus X1. Um, and what you see on the slide here is the X-ray light curves on the left and, and the radio ones on the right with a bit of a schematic of approximately where they, the emission might be coming from in the jet. Um, and with this study, what we ended up finding was that the radio signals we observed were showed some clear structure variability in the form of these small scale flaring events. And this emission was varying significantly down to at least tens of second time scales. Now, when we compared the X-ray and the radio, uh, we found that this emission was actually highly correlated, um, not just between the radio bands, but between the radio and the X-ray. And through using the cross-correlation techniques that I talked briefly about earlier, we found clear time delays between our bands, about tens of minutes between the radio and the X-ray. Um, and through mapping out these legs, like you see in the schematic at the bottom of the slide, we see a clear trend in these legs where the lower frequencies are always lagging the higher frequencies. And this lag starts getting longer and longer as we start probing emission regions further out in the jet. This means that these legs are consistent with actually tracing the propagation of material along the jet flow. Um, now, X-ray binary experts will know that, you know, finding a radio X-ray leg isn't, um, is it new in X-ray binary studies, but the fact that we've got multiple legs here to different bands, that is what's new and that's what's important because with multiple legs, we can actually model these legs and get a direct measure of the jet speed. Um, and that's actually what we did here uh, for the first time in an X-ray binary system. And we found that the Cygnus X1 jet was actually quite fast. Um, we estimated a bulk Lorentz factor of about three. So, this, this first kind of pilot study of these techniques in the radio was not only successful observationally in terms of proving that you know, radio timing is possible, we can do this, but you can also see that we've begun to start pulling, begun to start actually being able to pull out real physics from just these time domain measurements. Um, but once again, we were even more ambitious and we thought, well, how can we make this better? Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to sample more wave bands simultaneously. So we can actually be sampling more regions of the jet. And um, the, an opportunity to do this actually came back in uh, March, 2018, during the outburst of MACHI J1820 plus 070. And so this system was first discovered as an optical transient by Assassin and has since been dynamically confirmed as black hole system. And it's an ideal target for these kind of uh, spectral timing experiments because right now we have a good parallax distance to this system. This thing was super bright, so we're talking hundreds of milliganskis in the radio and the submillimeter. And we knew from the beginning of the outburst that it was highly variable in the optical and x ray. So if you know those bands probing the accretion flow are super variable, it gives us a hint that we might see fireworks in the radio and the submillimeter probing the jet as well. And indeed, that is what we ended up seeing. Um, here, what we did was we combined this synced up subarray VLA with ALMA this time in the submillimeter to give us this killer combination of coverage. Um, and these are the light curves that we ended up coming up with, um, ALMA on the left and VLA on the right in the different bands. And you can see, we see, again, clear structured variability, um, really rapid flaring in ALMA, and it gets less and less rapid as we go down in frequency, which is something we'd expect if this variability is coming from the jet because you know the almost a millimeter frequencies are probing much closer to the black hole, an area with a much smaller cross-section than compared to the lower radio frequencies. 
So to try and analyze what we're seeing here in the variability, we started with uh, the four-year domain. So we created some power spectra of the mission that we saw in the different bands. And that's what you see here on the right of the slide. You'll notice that all of the power spectra show kind of a broken power law type morphology where the highest power occurs at the lowest for your frequencies corresponding to the longest time scale sampled. However, you also see that there's clear differences between this power spectra for the different electromagnetic bands where higher electromagnetic frequencies, that's all mine, the green here, um, tend to show higher peak variability amplitudes. And you can almost see that the break in the power spectrum seems to be moving to lower 40 frequencies as we shift to the lower electromagnetic frequency bands. And this is the first time we've actually seen evolving power spectra with electromagnetic frequency in um, an X-ray binary. And it's super exciting because this is something we've been looking for from the beginning of these studies is it's actually what's predicted um, from JET models as well. Um, for example, you can see on the left side of the slide, um, a prediction of what the power spectra should look like at different electromagnetic bands from a Julian Malzak's internal shock model. And you, again, you see this sort of evolution with a break in the, in the power spectra, it starts moving to lower Fourier frequencies as you sample those lower electromagnetic bands. So to put a bit more of a um, quantitative spin on this, here on the slide, you'll see a plot of the break frequency in the power spectra from the previous slide, as well as the uh, integrated fractional RMS under the power spectra, basically just a good measure of um, variability amplitude in the different bands. And um, you can see the a nice beautiful trend pop out in both of these different metrics um, as well. Now, what we think at least to first order is that this changing for your frequency um, break is actually tracing the distance downstream to the different emission regions in the jet. And uh, one of my colleagues actually came up with a really good sort of analogy of what, we're, what we think we're actually doing here. It's almost like we're using the black hole or the accretion signal as radar or sonar, kind of mapping, being able to map out the structure in the jet, which is quite cool. Um, now, similar to our CX1 study, we also went to look for um, any kind of correlations between our bands and uh, time delays as well. And just like Sigmund's X1, we also found that all our radio and cellular bands were highly correlated with clear measurable delays on the order of a few minutes. Um, that's what you see here on the slide. Um, we have lags between our highest radio band, uh, 26 gigahertz, down to the lower ones. Uh, all right, so what we've done here is we've measured, we have a bunch of different timing characteristics that we've measured here, right? We have our for your break frequencies, we have our legs, and then we also get for free our average um, spectrum of the jet as well. So the question is, how can we actually connect these timing metrics to some real jet physics? Well, it turns out that if, in the framework of a traditional kind of Blanford conjugal jet, you can actually predict how all these quantities are gonna change with electromagnetic frequency. Now, the problem is if you try and model any individual data dimension here, you're gonna be met with a highly degenerate model. But what we did or what we found is that if you can actually model all of these quantities together, plus add the, in the fact that we have independent constraints on the distance and the inclination angle to the system, we can actually break these degeneracies. Um, and that's actually what we did. Uh, on the slide here, you see the legs, the four-year break frequency, and the average spectrum all simultaneously modeled with um, this plan for chondral jet model. You can see we can reproduce these measured quantities actually pretty extremely well. And in doing so, what we actually ended up finding was MAPC 1820, so it was a highly relativistic jet. So even faster than what we found in Cygnus X1, closer to a bulk Lorentz factor of almost four. Um, we found that it was highly confined, so opening angles less than a degree. And interestingly enough, we also found that the jet was carrying a lot of power, almost 10% of the bolometric extra luminosity at the time. So the kind of bottom line here is that 
we've we've developed a method where we're actually able to derive some fundamental jet properties from just the light curves alone, um, which is incredibly powerful. Three minutes. Thanks. So uh, now that we've laid kind of the groundwork for these for using these time domain tools, we need to expand these studies to address some of the major shortcomings that we still have in this current framework. Uh, number one is the majority of these studies are one-shot observations. So they're unable to probe how jets evolve over time during their outbursts. Um, for example, this is the sub-millimeter coverage we had of MAXI 1820 during its outburst, where only one of these observations was actually enabled to do timing. Imagine if your coverage instead looked like this, where all of these observations were able to do timing. You could actually be able to start driving these jet properties for each observation and then be able to see how they're actually evolving throughout the outburst. Um, the second shortcoming is that studies focusing on longer wavelengths, the radians, like the radio and submillimeter, have been remained separate from those on the shorter wavelengths, just like I've presented them in this talk. Everything's quite separate. Um, and that really means that we're unable to connect variability across different regions of the inflowing material and the jet as well. So how do we deal with this, um, these kind of shortcomings? Well, I've developed a multi-year observing program that we call Pitch Black. So it stands for Polarization and Timing Characteristics in Black Hole Jets. And it connects a global network of telescopes anchored by the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope here in Hawaii. And the idea is we're going to do a systematic time domain study of these extra binary systems by simultaneously observing six systems throughout their outbursts across a range of time scales and wavelengths over the next three years. And we hope that we're going to be able to build up a large kind of uniformly sampled set of observations that allows us to start actually answering some of the key open questions that we still have about these jets. Uh, now, since this is a Chandra meeting, I also want to talk a bit about what uh, Chandra can do for this kind of science. So we've just started this pitch black program. And so we're actively seeking more and more instruments to add to it. And Chandra is at the top of that list for x-ray coverage, as it gives us a lot of different benefits, uh, sensitivity, low background levels, and um, already have, we can have joint projects with radio instruments like the VLA. And to give you a kind of a hint of what a synced up Chandra and VLA could do in terms of spectral timing experiments, um, I want to highlight some really nice work being done by Rich Plotkin right now in terms of actually extending these kind of timing studies into quiescence. So here we have an example of some recent work on V4 for signaling in quiescence. Uh, we, we have a long simultaneous stare um, with the VLA and Chandra. And um, you see the light curves on the slide there. And you'll notice that we were able to actually resolve some simultaneous flaring in the radio and the x-ray. And this is, to our knowledge, at least the first time we've been able to do this in a quiescent system, which is quite cool. Um, we even have some tentative suggestions of some tens of minutes lags between the x-ray and the radio um, with this data set. Again, similar to the kind of magnitude of the lags we are seeing in 1820 and 6.1. Um, and this kind of work is really opens up a possibility of doing these kind of timing observations, comparing fundamental jet properties, not only across accretion states and outbursts, but also between outbursts and quiescence. And it's really gonna allow us to understand much more about these jets at lower accretion rates, where we, our knowledge is even more limited. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you of today that you know, time domain analysis is a really powerful tool to study accretion and jet physics, near compact objects. And we can do this all the way from the X-ray down to the radio bands. You know, I've shown you a method that allows us to actually start pulling out real jet physics from these time domain measurements, you know, driving fundamental jet properties from just the light curves alone. And while there has been a lot of early successes in, in these kind of spectral timing studies, all the way from the optical and infrared to the radio, they're still very much in their infancy. So we need to continue to improve and adapt these kind of studies. And looking towards the future, this means adding more instruments um, with capabilities like Chandra um, and looking to next gen instruments like NGVLA and ALMA 2030. They're going to play such a key role in this science in terms of increased sensitivity and wavelength coverage. 
So there's a lot of exciting prospects for continuing to develop these spectral timing experiments. And I really believe they're gonna be key in driving some new discoveries in the X-ray binary field over the coming years. Um, and before I stop talking, I'm just a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, my current fellowship ends next year, so I am on the job market. And if you know of any positions, I would greatly appreciate a heads up. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions from our attendees. I remind the attendees, if you have a question, to put it into the Q&A, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible. Uh, this question is from Agniva, and they ask, we know break timescales in accretion disk variability may imply viscous timescales. How close are the break timescales in radio coming from the jet and x-rays from the disk corona? Uh, from the same source, and what does it mean in the context of jet variability here? So the the kind of like viscous time scales in the accretion flow, those are going to be much um, much faster than what we're dealing with in terms of the jet, which is much more on like a kind of uh, minute to tens of minute time scale. Um, but the idea is we think that you know the they are they are still quite connected. It's that the um, jet the variability in the accretion flow is actually driving variability in the jet. Um, for example, if you if you think of, you can think about it in terms of um, as I briefly mentioned, I talk uh, Julian Malzak's internal shock model. So in this model, what we essentially have is these shells um, being injected into uh, the base of the jet. Um, plasma from the accretion flow, presumably. And, you know, they, they rejected at uh, different bulk velocities. So faster shells are going to catch up with slower shells. And when they collide, we're going to get these internal shocks. And um, that's actually what we think is producing this kind of variability, these small scale flaring events. So it is, it is quite all connected, even though that, you know, the time scales we're dealing with in the accretion flow are much faster than what we're dealing with in a jet in terms of variability. And the question from Tom Macaron, uh, how valuable would it be to have a Chandra-Alma joint proposal option? Oh, in incredibly valuable. Um, with these kind of studies, it's the more, the more simultaneous um, wave band coverage that we can get, the better, because, you know, as, as I mentioned, it, the jet higher frequencies are probing closer to the base and lower frequencies farther out. So we can be sampling the radio, the submillimeter, the infrared, and then optical and x-ray as well from the accretion fall all at once. Um, we can measure, not only look at, you know, what's happening in the power spectrum, but we can measure with these legs. And if we have enough um, actual uh, wavelength coverage, we have the potential to not only be measuring, you know, jet speed from the legs, but maybe even start getting at um, whether we can actually observe acceleration in the jet as well. So yeah, that would be, that would be incredibly useful. Hey, do we have any additional questions? And I'd like to uh, tell the panelists that you cannot use the Q&A feature. So if you have a question for the speaker, any of the speakers uh, during their turn, raise your hand or enter it into the chat. Okay, we have a question uh, from Mike Nowak. Uh, what about the coherence function? Oh, that's that's an excellent question. Yeah, so doing um, computing that kind of that cross spectral analysis and looking at the coherence, um, it's it's something that we we did a bit of in the Cygnus X one study, even though I didn't talk about it. Um, and we've 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 computed it for the eighteen twenty data as well. But right now we're just. Uh, we're honestly having a bit of trouble interpreting what we're seeing from it. Um, uh, but yeah, that can, that can also give us uh, quite a lot of more information. And what's great about, you know, doing those kind of cross spectral metrics is we're able to, you know, look at the, that lags, the coherence again, split over many different time scales of variability, and it can give us a much better idea of what's going on if we can actually figure out what it means. Um, but yeah, we're certainly looking at that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's something that we're currently doing.
Great. There's no more questions for our speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank you again. I, I wish you good luck on the job market. And uh, uh, will our next speaker begin to prepare their or share their slides? Our next speaker is, I'm sorry, I've lost my place. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Brianna Binder coming to us from Cal Poly Pomona and will talk to us about Chandra monitoring in the follow-up of NGC 300 ULX1. All right, thank you very much. And so, yes, I wanna give you just a brief update about one of my favorite sources in the nearby universe, um, the ultraluminous X-ray source in NGC 300. So this uh, ULX contains a pulsar and likely a red supergiant donor star. Uh, and it's been observed to exhibit these extreme flux variations over multi-year timescales. So this is a light curve that's constructed uh, with swift monitoring data shown in green here, going from about 2016 um, through early 2019. And just to kind of help guide your eye, the Eddington limit for a neutron star is approximately at where this purple line is here. So you can see that this source really does reach uh, ultraluminous uh, fluxes, but in the second half of 2018, the uh, flux of the source really decreased dramatically. And so one uh, proposed hypothesis for what could be causing this sudden decrease uh, in flux is the lens steering effect. And so in this scenario, the inner accretion disk is precessing due to frame dragging effects near the neutron star. Uh, and that's causing the uh, us to sometimes be able to see directly to the central x-ray source. And sometimes we're looking through a large column of obscuring material very close to the x-ray source. And if this uh, model is correct, uh, that would be really interesting because the time scale of this precession depends on physical properties of the system, like the mass accretion rate and the spherization radius of the system. So if we had continued monitoring over multi-year timescales, uh, we could confirm this model and start to place some really interesting constraints on kind of the geometry of the system. And so that is what we have been doing. This is an updated version of this light curve, again, with the Eddington limit shown to help guide your eye. Uh, there's been a recent uh, swift monitoring campaign and those upper limits are shown in red. So we can say that the source is still in this kind of low flux state, except for this one solid black point where we have a firm detection. And that firm detection comes to us from Chandra. And so this is an image uh, that Chandra obtained of ULX1 earlier this year. Um, and so the source is still pretty robustly detected with Chandra due to the great sensitivity. And I just wanna note that one of the reasons why Chandra is great is not only the sensitivity, um, but ULX1 sits very close on the sky, only about an arc minute or so away from NGC 300X1, which is a persistently bright source. Um, so no matter what flux state ULX1 is in, resolving these two sources from one another uh, is really quite effortless with Chandra, which is very important uh, for uh, extracting good science. So given that the flux is still low, we can say that we know this precession timescale must be longer than about two years. And what does this imply? Well, we can start to place some interesting constraints on the system. The mass accretion rate implied by this timescale is something like 20 to 25 times the Eddington accretion rate. Uh, these are fairly reasonable estimates and previous X-ray observations have been consistent with a more or less constant mass accretion rate kind of on this order. Uh, so that uh, is consistent with earlier X-ray observations from Chandra, from XMM, from Swift, et cetera. This also tells us that the spherization radius is likely on the same order as the magnetosphere radius in the system. 
Now, exactly how these two quantities um, compare to one another depends on the exact accretion geometry you assume, what you assume for the outflows in the system. Um, but at the moment, these observations suggest that these two quantities are likely similar to each other within a factor of about two or so. So with continued monitoring with both SWIFT and with Chandra, uh, hopefully we will eventually catch this uh, object going into uh, one of these bright states again. And once we have that precession timescale uh, measured, we can start to uh, get even more firm estimates of these, uh, these parameters of the system. So that concludes my lightning talk. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Brianna, I was mesmerized by your work that I stopped looking at my clock. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions right now for you, but we might have time at the end uh, to field some questions from you. All right, thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Aaron Shaw from University of Nevada, Reno who will talk to us about observations of the disk jet coupling of X-ray binaries during their descent to quiescence, the case for rapid follow-up. And Aaron could not make it, and he explains in the video that I'm about to play uh, why that is, but we do have somebody here to fill the questions at the end of his talk. Oops, sorry about that. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Aaron Shaw. I'm a postdoc at the University of Nevada in Reno. Uh, and unfortunately I can't be here today live uh, because I broke my collarbone and the only orthopedic appointment I could get overlaps with uh, my talk slot. So sorry about that, but I'm still going to present my research on the disk jet coupling of X-ray binaries. In particular, I'm going to focus on um, black hole X-ray binaries and their descent to quiescence. Um, so this is the classic picture of a black hole X-ray binary. We have a black hole, which is accreting matter from a low mass companion. And the two components that we're most interested in today in um, the context of this talk are the disk and the jet, which are both labeled in the above um, artist's impression. Uh, black hole X-ray binaries often undergo uh, outbursts, which last uh, several months. Um, uh, the bottom uh, figure is a light curve showing the outburst of Maxi J1820. And we can see that we see the outburst across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the, one of the ways that we often visualize black hole X-ray binary outbursts is uh, with the so-called hardness intensity diagram shown here. Um, now, black holes often start in, in the quiescent state on the bottom right hand uh, part of this figure. Uh, and when an outburst um, initiates, it increases in flux and um, in the so-called hard state, which is characterized by um, the existence of a compact radio jet uh, and a hard X-ray spectrum. But as the outburst progresses, um, we often see transitions into the so-called soft state where the radio jet is ejected and the X-ray spectrum becomes uh, extremely soft and disc dominated. And then as the outburst continues, it decreases in flux and heads back towards the hard state on the right-hand side of the plot. Uh, and heads back towards quiescence. And what we're particularly interested in is the physics that is happening at this point here in the uh, hardness intensity diagram. What happens as the source heads towards quiescence? Now, what do we observe? Uh, a couple plots here from um, some of Rich Plotkin's papers shows that as the luminosity decreases, we see a softening of the X-ray spectrum. Uh, the y-axis here shows the photon index gamma um, and the x-axis shows the luminosity. And we can see that um, the, as the luminosity decreases, the power law index goes from a typical hard state value of around 1.6, 1.7 to 
to plateauing at around gamma of two. And this softening completes at around 10 to the minus five uh, to 10 to the minus six Eddington fraction. The bottom left figure is uh, similar, but uh, has V4046 2015 uh, outburst plotted on there. And we can see that that happens um, in V4046 as well. And it kind of plateaus around gamma of two again. The cause of this softening is unclear. However, um, it likely involves some kind of radiatively inefficient process. And we can usually split the uh, proposed mechanisms for the softening into two caps. So we can either consider accretion flow based models or jet based models. And uh, on the left, we show a typical accretion flow based model, um, which is uh, usually based on some version of a radiatively inefficient accretion flow, such as an ADAF. SNL 1997 showed that uh, with decreasing m dot, their model suggests that um, with decreasing m dot or luminosity, we would expect the x ray um, spectrum to get steeper, i.e., i.e., to get softer. Um, there are jet based models as well. For example, the softening might be due to uh, synchrotron cooling of electrons in a jet. Um, Heinz 2004 showed that that indeed produced a steeper x ray spectrum. Or we could ha uh, have other jet based models, such as a decreasing efficiency of particle acceleration, uh, where with decreasing luminosity, we see the synchrotron jet spectrum steepen. Or there could be some synchrotron self Compton processes generated within the jet. And the softening we see is due to a decrease in the so called Compton Y parameter. Now, it's hard to distinguish between the models uh, because, well, A, um, it is uh, th these sources are obviously naturally very faint as they head towards quiescence. Uh, and B, sometimes the softening actually happens quite rapidly. Um, so for example, V404 I showed in uh, a few slides ago, that's uh, softening from power law index of 1.6 to, uh, to two happened over the course of around five days. So it's important that we get kind of rapid follow-up uh, so we can track this softening as quickly as it happens. Uh, now, one place to start to try and differentiate between the models will, would be uh, LRLX, which is the radio luminosity, X-ray luminosity correlation that we so often see in black hole X-ray binaries. The fact that a correlation exists between the X-ray and radio luminosities um, suggests that there is some intimate interplay between the disk and the jet, the so-called disk-jet connection that we talk about so much. Uh, this figure here highlights V4046 um, progress through LRLX, and it seems to follow the so-called standard track where we have a slope of 0.5 to 0.7 as it heads towards quiescence. But not all sources do that. H1743, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, followed a radio quieter or a steeper track and then apparently switched to the so-called standard track after a certain amount of time. And this switching to the standard track might suggest that there is some kind of um, some kind of switch of mechanisms for the for the emission processes and maybe we could utilize LRLX to investigate the emission processes that are going on. Now we can go back to V404 SIG again. Uh, this is a, a paper, um, sorry, a plot from a plot canal, Plotkin et al. 2017. And we can see uh, the 1989 outbursts plotted on there. Um, and the blue points are the hard state uh, decay points from 2015. And there are also two red points there which show um, quiescence, um, observations from quiescence. And we can use LRLX here to rule out certain models for the softening. If, uh, for example, we, uh, if for example the softening is due to a, a synchrotron called jet, then we might expect, or we would expect, sorry, LRLX to steepen at that precise moment where the uh, power law index uh, saturates at two. But we don't see that in V four hundred four. We see that it continues along the standard track well into quiescence. Um, so we don't see that kind of switch to a steeper. Um, <clears throat> LRLX. So we can use this to rule out a synchrotron called jet, 
which leaves for V404, the softening could be due to uh, radiatively inefficient accretion flow or some other jet-based model. Uh, but V404 is only one source, and this is the only one where we've got good coverage into quiescence uh, as it decayed. Um, now, I'm going to present to you our work on MaxiJ1820, which went into outburst in 2018. Um, and in the top left plot, we can see our light curve of the decay. The, the black points represent the decay of the initial outburst, and the blue points represent the decay of one of the so-called reflares. And in the bottom panel of that top left figure, we can see that indeed we see a softening. Um, this is um, using Chandra, Swift, and VLA um, uh, data. We could see that a little bit better in the um, the bottom right figure, which shows the softening, the power law index versus luminosity, and uh, we can see that indeed we are, the softening completes it again around ten to the minus five uh, Eddington fraction, and the bottom panel of that figure shows uh, that it's uh, it's it's similar to what we see for the average of all other black hole X-ray bin binaries. If we look at LRLX, we see that this is indeed another standard track source. And uh, we can see that it has a slope of around 0.52. And if we um, uh, add on the expected synchrotron cooled jet track, we would expect to see it steepen from that 0.5 to um, a slope of around 1, uh, 1.2, I believe. Uh, and we don't see that. So we can rule out the synchrotron cool jet like we did with V404. Um, we also have radio spectral measurements, uh, which allow us to rule out a steepening particle distribution as well. If we, if the softening was due to a steepening particle distribution, what we would see is that the LRLX would uh, get shallower as the decay progressed. And what we we don't see that. In fact, what we see is uh, it seems to meander around the best fit line, which is that dashed line there we do not see it overall get shallower. So where does this leave us? Well, hopefully I've shown you that radio X-ray spectral monitoring of black holes is crucial uh, for understanding disk jet couplings at low luminosities. And MaxiJ1820 is only the second source that has good coverage of the decay toward quiescence in both X-rays and uh, radio. And the reason this is, is because MaxJ1820 is a nearby fairly low column black hole, uh, which allows us, um, uh, sorry, which means it's a lot brighter um, because it's closer to us. And uh, the only reason we were able to do this as well was because of Chandra and VLA's quick follow-up capabilities. But in the future, could we also use uh, rapid and high cadence follow-up to investigate, for example, the deviations that I briefly talked about from the LRLX best fit. Could we um, potentially use, uh, get strictly simultaneous um, observations to, to, to investigate this? I show this plot on the right, which shows the, in the on the y-axis, at y-axis, the deviation from the best fit LRLX in, uh, log radio luminosity space versus the radio spectral index. And we see a hint of a anti-correlation. Now, this isn't statistically significant, but it is uh, intriguing enough. Um, uh, and could this anti-correlation be real? And could this tell us a little bit more about the emission processes that are going on? Um, I'm running out of time now, so I'm, I'm going to leave it there and say thank you for listening. Once again, I'm really sorry I can't be there, but if you have questions, uh, please forward them to my email address, which is on the screen now. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Aaron for that uh, re pre recorded talk and open the field to questions for. Um, the for the talk, uh, we actually have rich Plotkin here serving as the. Uh, question answer. And we have a question, uh, Rich, from Agniva, who asks, is there any physical model for the jet disk coupling and x-ray binaries? Uh, yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me. 
So the basic idea behind that and the stuff that Aaron was talking about is relevant basically for the hard state and to quiescence. So we're talking about inefficient accretion flows with that are geometrically thick. And the idea, you know, simply being that the jets are being launched by those accretion flows. So what's feeding into the inner parts of the flow is naturally, you should expect should also be coupling into what we actually see in the relativity outflow in terms of the jet. Um, and then there's, you know, there's various degrees of sophistication on that. Um, lots of review papers um, go through that. And then I think one of the more interesting ones to me is the Melzack model that you've seen talked about already, where you have uh, propagations from the um, outer parts of the flow, they can kind of multiply as they go inwards. And then that could uh, form internal shocks along the jet that then uh, get fed into your relative scale flow. But yeah, I say there's several different uh, variations of, the, of that type of physical model. Great. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. If you have a quick question for Rich on Aaron's talk. If not, I uh, thank you again, Rich, for stepping in to do the Q&A and uh, send our uh, thanks to Aaron as well. Uh, will the next speaker start preparing their slides and sharing them? Our next speaker is Bree Mills, coming to us from the University of Virginia, and will talk to us about the spin of GRS 1915 plus 105 revisited. Great, thank you. So I wanted to revisit a highly debated topic, which is that of the spin of GRS 1915 plus 105. So GRS is a highly variable black hole X-ray binary famous for its unique variability properties as observed by both Chandra and Rossi X-ray timing explorer. It was also famous for radio observations showing that it was the first galactic superluminal source. So understanding this unique variability is a prime motivation for characterizing the mass and spin of the black hole in this system, which directly affects the black hole space time and in turn could affect the variability. So many groups have tried to characterize the spin of GRS via relativistic iron line methods, as well as fitting the X-ray continuum of the source to get at the spin. So among the continuum fitting community, two groups shown here, the Durham group on the left and the CFA group on the right, arrived at two very different spins, even though they used the same continuum fitting method and nearly the same mass distance and inclination for GRS. So this discrepancy in spins likely comes from the fact that they chose different RxDE spectra for their analysis. So they differ in their data selections. So several years after those two groups published their spins, new constraints for the properties of GRS were published so previously, we thought the distance to GRS was about 11 to 12 kiloparsecs with a 14 solar mass black hole and about a 60 degree accretion disk inclination. But new constraints from Reed et al. show that the distance is actually a lot closer to us at a distance of about 8.6 kiloparsecs with a slightly less massive black hole and a slightly higher inclination of the disk. So the disk, the distance comes from um, impressive VLBI parallax measurements and the inclination comes from uh, constraints on the superluminal jet motion. And it's also um, important to note that these parameters, mass distance inclination, um, depend on each other. So the mass is a function of the inclination and the inclination is a function of the distance. Using these new constraints along with the same data from these two groups, we found that the spin for the Durham group was pushed to a higher spin of 0.93 and that the CFA group spin wanted to push above the maximum spin limit for a black hole, which is 0.99. And we were not able to get a good fit with these new constraints for their data set. But despite these impressive results from the VLBI parallax and constraints on the superluminal jet motions, there are still uncertainties in the read it all best fit mass distance and inclination for GRS. So here we explore the effect of these system parameter uncertainties on the best fit spin. So this plot here is showing randomly selected distances and the corresponding masses and inclinations. So each point in this scatter plot represents one realization for a given mass, distance, and inclination within one sigma. And this is plotted against the best fit spin for those fixed parameters. 
The bottom x-axis in these scatter plots is in um, log of one minus spin. And this is just to better show the results of the higher spins. And plotted at the top, the x-axis is just the spin by itself for readability with increasing spin to the left. The bottom right panel is a histogram of all the best fit spins we obtained and they're shown in gray and spins with 99% confidence are shown in black. So from these preliminary results with the new constraints, we can see that the best fit spins in this histogram for GRS peak at more moderately high spins with the tail going out to maximal spin. And this is using data from the Durham group. And with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bree, for excellent uh, lightning talk. We have a question from Evan Smith. Uh, do you look at its evil twin, IGRJ170191-3624? <laughs> I was not aware of an evil twin, um, so I would say no. <laughs> but I'm very curious now. <laughs> yeah, I am also curious uh, what makes it its evil twin. Maybe if we have a minute, we could let Evan tell us. Uh, this question is from Tom Macaron. Uh, you end up with some bad spectral fits. Are those then telling us something about the parameter space that is acceptable for the mass distance inclination? So the, the bad fits that we get from the um, CFA group, um, that's for with the new mass distance inclination. So since the distance is now closer to us, fixing it there, that's what's giving us the, the bad spins um, because it wants to go above 0 0.99. Um, so it, it it is an effect of the, the system um, and parameters that we set. Um, and the question, um, uh, he meant the bad chi-squared, uh, but I think that's... So we have a question from Dominic Walton asking, can you comment on the editing ratios of the data used? Yes, um, so the two different groups um, so here I show that there are some differences in their data selection. So the Durham group um, showed they didn't have any restrictions on the, the Eddington ratios. So there are three notable spectra um, from their data set and those have Eddington ratios ranging from uh, like 20% Eddington to 50% Eddington and one that gets near Eddington. Um, and for the CFA group, they um, made a hard cut and said that they wanted to use data below 30% Eddington. Great. Okay, I'll ask our next uh, speaker to start sharing their slides. And there are additional questions for you, Bree, in the uh, Q&A box that you can respond to via text, or you can save until the end of the session. Our next speaker is Jun Yang from MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research, and will talk to us about uh, measure the gas to dust ratio towards bright sources in the galactic bulge. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I will talk about various unique and extra absorption towards the source in the galactic bulge, including how to measure the silicon and gas to dust ratio. Low in dust content of silicon in interstellar matter is necessary to understand the composition and the evolution of the interstellar media, which help us to understand the cooling and heating process of the interstellar media and that dominates the star formation rate of our galaxy. Uh, we use the Chandra high energy transmission weighted spectrometer to measure the broadband hydrogen equivalent absorption in these uh, bright sources. We identify the variabilities with the uh, near edge absorption. The goal is to obtain silicon gas to dust optical ratio toward uh, different light of size in the galactic parts. This figure shows the cross section for hydrogen nucleus for the Wigartner dust model based on Christine Oliver. The blue line is the scattering and the red is the absorption and the black is the extinction. So we can say the scattering significantly contributes to the extinction. Uh, this is the optical depth of the function of energy. 
uh, we can say the scattering is almost equally as the absorption contributes to the extinction. Uh, this map uh, shows the location of the gold sources in the galactic barge. And the background is from the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper Survey. The source labeled in black are part of our current survey, and the blue are our mini proposed data for the future of the wind. Uh, we use a newly uh, well calibrated and pair of three Chandra data. Uh, so, here this table shows for this source. The simultaneous observation from Chandra RXPE, uh, the Chandra um, produces a higher edge value because it has a smaller point spread function, which excludes the scattering, the RXPE within the scattering. Uh, this map shows the PSF comparison between the different instruments uh, with the uh, inclusion and scattering inclusion. So uh, the Chandra has a smaller PSF, um, and uh, we compare the edge value from Chandra with the other instruments for this source. The observation for X Newton uh, in red and uh, RXT in green. Face up in blue. So we can say the, the all the source are below the equality line. So as the edge value becomes larger, they more likely diverge and the more scatter and goes away. Uh, this uh, we have put the source is a function as a function of the water water band hydrogen column density. Uh, they are all above the unity line. So they are highly significant abundant, um, which indicates a different uh, cross section for different uh, significant molecules. We can see the high resolution structure of the silicon KH when we look at the HDD data and the highest uh, resolution. So this is an example for GHD plus one. Uh, this term, we can see the scattering and the atomic silicon KH and the silicate KH. Here we show the two extreme cases of the high resolution structure in the silicon edges. On the left, it's a GXG plus one. You can see the significant gas and the dust or peak depth. On the right, it's takes uh, five minus one, where the dust dominates only meter gas contributes. If we compare, we say it's a takes two plus one. Here we have put the sources of peak depth together, the uh, gas plus dust edge of peak depth as a function of the gas edge of the depth. And on the left, it's uh, all data. We can see this uh, scattering due to different modes and uh, data from different instruments. On the right, we can see most of the source, uh, they are trend aligned with the uh, MRN standard dust distribution. There are some exceptions. <clears throat> For example, GX5-1, the gas plus dust edge of the depth is six times the gas edge of the depth. So they are the dust, uh, very dusty, and also that means the, the dust growing size is very small. Um, this figure shows <clears throat> the equivalent wise and the near edge absorption as a function of the hydrogen equivalent absorption. So the red line is calculated based on the dust mode. Uh, but we can see that the many data points above this line. So it shows the, the silicon K edge variabilities in the uh, equivalent widest near edge absorption. Uh, 
list of products uh, shows for the source clicks to class one from the observation, channel observation uh, from cycle 16 and cycle 18. And the bottom left is uh, from Chandra cycle 19. So, uh, identify interstellar medium, the gas optical depth, and the fast optical depth. I'll show you the red line. Uh, will be the, uh, remain the same at the time it works. However, in the data, as you the black and the 6.71 and 6.73 and from uh, there shows uh, variabilities. Uh, we identify this uh, variability from the airline silicon. Um, so we propose this airline airline silicon from the silicon battery medium. This figure shows the recent calculation for the cross section for different airline silicon. Uh, we will use uh, this to model the airline silicon in this structure. Uh, so far, we have obtained the gas to dust uh, optic ratio for different sources in the galaxy part. Uh, this source, these ratios are data designed and completely independent of any edge modeling. So, also in this data, we can see also the variability ranging from very dusty edges at six by minus one to some source with meter dust contribution at six three plus one. Now we are using the syndicate model to determine, determine the mass form density, abundance, and the possibly modified cross section. So next step, we would like to include the allied silicon models in our final phase to account for the uh, possible variabilities. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to take your question. Thank you, June. If you have any questions for June, uh, please uh, enter them into the Q&A box. Um, I have a question about the variable variability in the equivalent width. Uh, what is that telling us? What do you think that is telling us? Um, <clears throat> so, because if there's because this tells us uh, uh, ILS silicon. If, if there's no variability, no, no ILS silicon, so there should be no data points. So all the data points should be um, aligned with the red line, the fast mode. So, this is a, so where do you think that variability is coming from? Um, I think that variability is from the ILS silicon. Is from the uh, circum the following. Ah. Yeah, which, yeah, which, which, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, are there any questions for June? If not, uh, we can open up the questions for everyone. Uh, in this session, if you have any questions for any of the speakers uh, today. Uh, Bree, there is a question for you from Mike Novak uh, that says, it might be interesting for you to check and see if there are any co correlation between fitted color correction and non-thermal fraction in the simple fits to see if there is an asymptote towards a good fit. Or uh, a yeah, comment. So yeah, so we did try to fit with simple, um, and the, so there is, um, I don't know if there's an asymptote towards good fits, but even with simple, we still get um, the same kind of results with um, both the Durham group and the DFA group. We also took care BB to look at the color corrections too, um, but we can talk about that later if you'd like. Great. Uh, any other questions for any of our speaker? Uh, Brianna did not get a Q and A. Uh, Shay, a good chance at one. Um, and I did have a question for you, Brianna, about um, 
you showed us how, how important Chandra's uh, resolution is. And I wonder how much of the emission from other satellites is contaminated for that particular source that you showed us. Yeah, so when the source is in the bright state, uh, if you look at it with XMM Newton, um, for example, there's, there's a lot of cross-contamination between, between the two sources. Um, it's not as bad with SWIFT, but you still have to be careful um, with, with SWIFT, particularly when ULX1 is in that really bright state. Mm -hmm. We have another question for you, Brianna. Uh, NGC 300 has been quasi regularly observed by XMM Chandra SWIFT since 2000. Can you place even tighter constraints on the precession timescale by considering the coverage further back in time? Or is the idea that the supernova 2010 DA event uh, was the onset of accretion in this system? And this is from Dominic Walton. Yeah, so um, whether or not the 2010 outburst uh, was the onset of accretion or just the first time we happened to see uh, the x-ray flux from, from this object is still a question of debate. I personally think it, it likely was the onset of accretion. Um, that outburst event, the, the fluxes that were obtained there, which Swift saw, um, were brighter and more rapidly variable even than what we saw in, for example, 2016 when the source re-entered the bright state. But in between, uh, that bright outburst in 2010, um, the, the source was observed with Chandra three times. Once later, uh, about, uh, I think it was six or seven months later uh, in 2010 with Chandra, um, and then twice in 2014. And in all three of those observations, uh, the flux levels are very comparable to what we are seeing now or what we saw earlier this year with Chandra. Um, so whether that means that we should expect a precession timescale that's perhaps more closer to five to six years, you know, in between that initial outburst event and the uh, emergence of the source as an ultra luminous X-ray source, or whether it was bright in the intervening time and just nobody was looking at it, um, I can't say for sure. So, so, guess, so we, we anticipate the precession timescale is going to be some, somewhere in between two to 10 years. Um, and so that's hopefully what we're going to be able to catch with uh, ongoing monitoring campaigns. So I guess the, have you looked at that data, that past data out earlier in the time frame of what you've, what you've considered? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, I've looked at it a lot. <laughs> uh, further comment from uh, Dom Walton. At the separation of one arc minute, X can separate ULX1 and X1 pretty well, I think. If SWIFT can resolve them, XMM can as well. Yeah, I'm just saying when, when you look at the XMM observation, uh, when ULX1 first became incredibly bright, um, you can see, you can definitely see the two sources distinctly from one another, but you definitely get a lot of, um, for example, streaks from uh, ULX1 that can contaminate one another, which um, is not such a big deal if you just care about ULX1, which of course, uh, you know, everybody did in 2016. Um, but our original, uh, the, 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 the study that got the new Chandra observations actually was a study X1, not ULX1. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want to study X1, which is nearby, it can be a bit problematic. Right. Any additional questions for any of our speakers? If not, I'd like to thank all of our speakers again, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this uh, early evening for me and afternoon, morning and night for others.
uh, for this last session of the X-ray binary uh, day that we've had in the Chandra Frontiers in Time Domain Science. Uh, thanks again to all our speakers. And remember, next week, uh, we start on Monday at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, UTC minus four. And I hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your weekend.